Okay, I'm going to uh, share a few things before the message. We'll start at 12 o'clock on the message. Uh, we're not going to have uh, worship this morning. Uh, Ruth uh, has COVID, and so we need to pray for her. And of course, the family, Wendy, Lewis, and John are staying home because of uh, the contact. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you give us life and life abundantly. And Father, we pray, uh, speak to, minister to, uh, encourage Ruth and the family uh, and others that have been touched by COVID. Father, that curse that uh, just seems to not stop, but you are the blessing. So we look to you for health, life, and understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So I'm going to take about 10 minutes here and share, give you a little uh, insight to uh, Jesus and he went to Peter uh, and he said uh, we have found the Messiah that uh, am I on? Well, I'm on down here so am I on now? I'm on now okay Sorry about that. Uh, so Andrew says to Peter, we have found the Messiah we have been looking for. So otherwise the two brothers had been searching for the Messiah. We need to have somebody close to us, a we that we can count on. And uh, I was with a couple of we, uh, that we that my wife and I have this week. Uh, Dave Day and his wife uh, Chrissy, uh, leaders of the Melchizedek's, uh, came up and we spent the whole day together. Uh, and what's interesting is we, we just talk about God. Uh, the center of our relationship is because of God. Yes, we have the Melchizedek ministry together. Yes, we're believers. Uh, but there's just something about knowing we're together be <clears throat> excuse me, because of God. And uh, what's interesting about uh, uh, Peter, Simon, uh, when he found the Messiah... Uh, Jesus changes his name to Peter because uh, his whole personality changed. His reputation changed. His mission in life changed. Uh, and it was all about God. And so uh, I, we enjoyed the four of us being together. Uh, and then we talked about a lot of things, family issues, and, the, and obviously the Melchizedek's and their ministry. And uh, he sent me pictures that the Melchizedek's were cooking while we were talking up here. Uh, They've reached out and to the Leathernecks, uh, a motorcycle group of all retired uh, uh, Marines. And they're cooking for this whole group and uh, had pictures of them. And, and so here's another avenue of, of the Melchizedek's ministering Christ uh, to bikers. Uh, but what was interesting about, uh, I've been having some high blood pressure. Uh, and after they left, the next morning I take my blood pressure, which is always higher in the morning, uh, and it had dropped 20 points. And I thought, isn't that biblical? Uh, a merry heart does good like medicine. Uh, and so uh, that just makes me think, uh, what are my thoughts? And when am I in the Spirit and when am I not? And who am I around that raises my blood pressure? But most of all, who am I around that lowers my blood pressure? And so uh, anyway, that's, uh, they are our we. I uh, have three other uh, messages I've been thinking about. I just finished a book this week, Jim Bridges, and he was a pioneer, uh, and he scouted for the, Indian, or for the uh, uh, soldiers. Uh, he was a buffalo hunter and all that out west. And uh, So I've got a message coming, uh, Jim Bridges and Dr. Pimple Popper. How many of you have seen that show, Dr. Pimple? That is sick. That is sick. My wife likes it. Ah, oh, that is gross. 
If you haven't seen it, look it up and tell me if that's not sick. Well, I got a sermon coming on Dr. Pimple Popper. But what started it was Jim Bridges. He got shot in the back by his spine and his hip uh, with an arrow. And for three years, he had this pain. Till finally, it was so bad, uh, he had to get it operated on. And who operated on it but the Reverend Dr. Uh, Marcus Whitman out of Gorham, uh, out west. And six men held him down to cut that open. And as they cut it open, because it had grown over in three years, the bone had actually attached to the arrowhead because the bone keeps growing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, of course, the message coming there is uh, what arrows do we have uh, that give us pain that we're putting up with that need to be operated and removed on? Uh, a, another uh, message I have, and I've had this one for about a month, I keep putting it back, further back, uh, is Samson and uh, the jawbone of an ass. And the idea of the jawbone, if you read that chapter, the jawbone was used for killing, but the jawbone was also gave forth water and it was used for life. Now you can see that correlation there. The jawbone, how your jaw can either minister life or minister death. Uh, so that's a sermon coming. I already have that one printed out, by the way. I just keep bumping it because, matter of fact, I was going to give it last week and Saturday morning, I go, ooh, ooh, and I ran down and changed the message. But anyway, uh, and then I, I just I wrote, so anyway, I read that book last, this past week and uh, I have another book, uh, Raising the Hunley. And Kathy and I were uh, down in Charleston when they discovered it and a few months later they raised it uh, and the uh, what, eight people that were on it, or five. And uh, uh, the youngest was supposed to be 20, and he confesses on his death, on, on, when they're going to open the hatch and, and everybody die, uh, that he's only 15. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought, where were we at 15? Were we willing, as Confederate, uh, the war, the battle has just started, uh, and they were willingly would give their lives to sink a Union ship, uh, what were you willing to do at 15? Uh, or how willing are you to give your life now for the body of Christ? So you see where that message is going. Okay, so uh, I was just taking that time to uh, allow people to get here because of the lack of worship because of Ruth. And we are certainly thankful for Ruth and the worship team. At this time, we'll have Pastor Deb uh, come and read the scriptures for today. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen. So many of the promises of God are conditional as we seek Him with our whole heart. Today I want to speak about biblical truths, reasons why God removes and adds uh, people from our life and into our life. And starting in Acts 15, uh, 36 through 41. Now this is Paul and Barnabas, and you have to remember these are major players in the New Testament. Uh, and they're coming at the time of the disciples, right after the disciples. And some days later, verse 36, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us again go and visit our brethren every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Otherwise, Paul and Barnabas had been making the missionary journeys throughout Israel. And Barnabas uh, determined to take them with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, and departed from them, from Panaphilia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention, now catch this, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. 
And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by their brethren into the grace of God. So otherwise, all the brothers, the body of believers at that time, blessed them both as they separated. And then they went throughout Syria and Cilicia, confirming the church or ministering to the body of Christ. So here we have Paul and Silas, and they can't, satis- they can't settle their contention, and that happens within the body of Christ. So they separated, and they both had a ministry. Now, every meeting in every life has a purpose for God, and it's normal for us to relate with people, and, be- and we assume that the relationship is going to be permanent, uh, but there will always be loss in moving on in our life. Change is an inevitable. Uh, people say, well, I don't like change. Well, you don't like life much. You're, you will be different today after you leave than when you came. It's just change happens all the time, physically, emotionally, spiritually. But no matter how you want to stick with them, uh, sometimes God separates like He did these two men. Now, you come in contact with people either for a moment for a time, for a season, or for a lifetime. And you don't know what that's going to be, but as you build your relationship, uh, sometimes it lasts and sometimes it doesn't. But God removes them from your life into, so that you can have a new chapter and a new understanding, a new direction in your life. And so it's not a coincidence when people are disconnected from you. You don't need to blame the devil, the world, the flesh, the devil. Now, it might be that, but we're talking about everyday living. Uh, Now, we see that starting at junior high, high school. Oh, but I love him, and he dropped me. Oh, they were my girlfriends, and now I'm not. I I watch preteen. It's like girls. Oh, you know, they all dropped me, and now they hate me. And, you know, I'm listening to that with our grandchildren now. And so, then you move into young adulthood, especially when God enters the picture. Often, your life, your friends from grade school or college or your job, they start separating and distancing. My wife had a friend that they went to, to elementary school all the way through school, uh, and then later, they, she lived here in the area. Uh, she kept coming to Kathy for counseling for years uh, because she was uh, alcoholic uh, and trying to get kicked that, and then she turned to drugs, and, and finally, Kathy, just because she was just going nowhere. Now, this is a friend from kindergarten, uh, and she finally said, look, no more, because you're a poor me. You want to be in control. You're not listening. You're not taking counsel. And so she writes her this letter. Uh, it's over. Stop contacting me. I'd t- sometimes I'd go and have lunch with them. While they were, and it was like they were just draining Kathy. And I thought, Kathy, why are you doing this? She's not changing. How many years has it been? And so she wrote it off. And then, like we normally do, then Kathy feels guilty. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. No, there's a time to say enough and let God remove that person from your life so that you can have a healthier person. However, it's human nature to cleave to people, to stay with people that we love, that we care about, and that's why we normally feel pain when somebody leaves us and cause us to move on faster. It's best to trust God's reason, and it could be one of these five that I'm going to speak about. Now, I'm going to give you five this week. I'm going to give you six more next week uh, that put a different spin on why people have God has taken people out of your life and to bring other people into your life. So whatever is happening in your life, trust God. Trust the Spirit of God. See, Peter, in Sunday school this morning, Peter, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Otherwise, he's getting down to where it's not in your head, it's in your heart. If you truly love me, Christ says to Peter, then you will do this. So in our life, we need to understand, do we truly love God? Yes. Do we truly love God? Well, yes, we said yes. Do we truly love God? And we say, yes, God, then He is going to show you His plan for your life. 
And it might be with friends and relationships and other company that you have, or it might not be. Some He's going to take out of your life, others He's going to put into your life. So the first reason that God removes people from our lives, God has a divine plan to fulfill. A plan for you. Now catch this. And you believe it and live it or you lose it. When God shows you His plan one step at a time, or maybe you caught a vision for down there and you don't know how to get there, one step at a time, you believe it, you live it, or you lose it. And that's why He will bring other people to you and He will also remove other people from you. God will take you to people. He will remove you from them. And the Lord allows them to be with you for a season. Meanwhile, it's for your advantage that He takes over and directs you in a different relationship. Now, from the moment we surrender to God, our lives to God, We've given Him permission to do His will. You are bought, you are purchased with a price. When you ask Christ into your life, you're no longer your own. Jesus bought you with His blood, the atonement. You belong to Him if you're really saved, if you really know that you are a child of God. And His will and His will be fulfilled in your life. Now, He will... Remove anyone and anything that hinders the fulfillment of His plan for your life. He will remove anyone and anything in order for fulfillment. For example, <clears throat> had a job that I liked, that I loved, and it was being a Kansas City police officer. I found it exciting. Uh, I found it challenging. I found a rush. I was going, this was forever. But then I started school and started getting some education and thinking I was going one way in law enforcement. But while I'm reading and also into Scripture, God speaks to me one morning. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. I jumped up off that couch like I'd been hit with an arrow. It's like, whoa. And I switched and went to the seminary. I had started finding the police department frustrated and boring. And, I, and the things that used to excite me all of a sudden now didn't excite me. But it moved from education to the call. And the call is what? Me speak in public? I, you know, I, I, I can't do, I, I didn't like that at all. I'm reading an article by Buffett, one of the billionaires of America, and he says three things about fear. Your fear is not real. Your fear is not real. It is, show it to me. It's not real. It's in your head. It's between your ears. Your fear is not real. So either put energy into that fear and let it grow, or put energy end of faith in the Word of God and let it grow. It takes no more energy, no more time, either fear or faith. So your fear is not real. Buffett continues, your fear is just drama not based on reality. Your fear is just drama not based on reality. Stop the drama. Start the faith in that place where that fear has gotten a hold. Kick fear out of your life. Release it. The third area, he says, fear, your fear, is exactly what you need to experience. Your fear is exactly what you need in the experience. See, fear will either paralyze you or, or fear will motivate you because you don't want to just stay there. And with a believer, it is to motivate us. See, when you face your fear, listen to this, it loses its power and control over you. When you face your fear, it loses power and control over you. The second reason God removes people and brings others into your life, your relationship with them might have become toxic, and the world is full of toxic people. You might hardly notice how secretly in, they envy you or dislike you, 
or they might be, have become a bad influence without you realizing it. See, toxic people, the influence they have in your life is subtle. It's distancing you from God, from your vision and the will of God in your life. I mean, how many times do you get an idea from God and you're going to run with it? You know it's of God. And then you talk to somebody who's toxic and they say, really? You? Why in the world would it be you? You're not qualified. And they give you all these reasons why you're not qualified. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3 says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So remember, from the moment you surrender your life to God, you've given Him permission to control your life for His purpose, His will in your life. So when God removes people from your life, it's because He knows that they are toxic. See, He can see their heart, and He knows the, the trouble that they could cause you, but He also knows the secret thoughts and feelings toward you. He desires to keep you away from toxic relationship. See, toxic people, catch this, drain you emotionally. Toxic people drain you spiritually. Toxic people, it's like even physically, you just feel shot after they leave. And, and you say, why? Because, well, that's a relative or that's a friend. I've had that friend, for, uh, the one I'm talking about with Kathy. Uh, every time she would come home from a lunch, it's like, I, I, you know, I'd take three days to get her back up. I, I said, Kathy, why are you listening to all that? Well, you know, she comes to me and she said, I've saved her life and, and she wouldn't have got it and all the, yeah, you did all the, but did she change? No. Then shut the door. Let her go. Remove her from your life. So the third area and reason is they might not be right for you. See, sometimes you're busy hanging around the wrong people instead of people that are build you up, they drag you down. And this is because they want to be in control and they're constantly manipulating. Well, you need to do this. Could you do this for me? Could you babysit for me? Could you run me over here? Could you buy me this? Could you help me out financially? Could you, could you, could you? And they're in control, people. That's a toxic person. And God, if you really want God, you, can't have, you don't have any energy left to give to God. So you cut those people out, and sometimes it's your relatives, sometimes it's your own children, sometimes it's your boss, sometimes, you know, who, if they're draining you emotionally, draining you spiritually, draining you physically, that is sin in your life that's attacking you, and you need to have that stopped. So when we realize that, see, it's a flesh thing, not a spiritual thing that's happening. It's a natural thing instead of a spiritual understanding. Now catch this. Most people, even Christians, don't understand what being led by God is. Most Christians don't understand what being led by God is. Now I'll tell you why. Because they're not in the Word of God, so they don't catch the connection. But the more you're in the Word of God, the more you start seeing, oh, Oh, whoa, all of a sudden the Word becomes alive and you start being led by the Spirit and you say, well, I had that thought. Well, there's the confirmation. Watch what happens now. And so, but even spiritual leaders can miss it. Let me give you a, a <laughs> and some catch it. Uh, is a woman that started cooking in our kitchen, and she now has Margarita's Kitchen out at the outlet mall. Uh, she started in our kitchen, and she got prophesied over that uh, her food would be known around the world by a minister that uses our church. And I'm thinking, okay, Raul, that's a big one, <laughs> you know. But hey, Raul, you're the pastor, not me. Come on around the world well lo and behold a spot opens up at the outlet mall over by waterloo and she's doing well and guess what vans from canada asians come people visiting from europe they come 
People from, she said, and her food is known from around the world. <laughs> All I do is cook in the kitchen. Nobody knows me. If God says your food is going to be known around the world, st you know, start cooking. And I had to, I, I, that just amazed me, okay? But there's also spiritual leaders that will miss it, ones you love and respect. When I was given the vision to come up and start a church in Geneva, my father, spiritual man, always respected him, admired him for his godliness. Says, son, he calls me, said, son, there's a church in Hawaii that needs a pastor, youth for a mission, and they're friends with the leader. Uh, and he said, come on over and he'll listen to you. I said, no, God said start a church in Geneva. And so he didn't like that. Well, anyway, he calls me and he says, son, there's a church in Lake Placid that needs a minister. I know that. And they said, they'll be glad to listen to you. I told them, you're looking for a church. And I said, I'm not looking for a church. You know, try, drive up to Lake Placid. I'm in Kansas City. No, not going to do that. Now, by the way, my wife and I, we went up there, and while we started skiing at Whiteface, uh, and here's this abandoned church right on Main Street that's abandoned. That's the church. It was an assembly of God who lost their... I said, I could have been pastoring here. Uh, and then the next year, they'd taken all the windows and the doors out. And, oh, no, they're tearing it down. And, and, and then the next year, we went, and it's gone. But the steps leading up are still there. The old stone wall still there. And I'm looking at that thing. And how many people sat on that stone wall and talked about God? How many people walked up those steps and stayed over underneath that tree and, and talked? How many people? What happened with God in this empty hole now? Now, I respected the man, but God didn't call me to have a church in Hawaii. Or maybe I didn't listen. No, no. And, 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 and he didn't call me to have a church in Lake Placid. I wouldn't have had to drive all those years. I could have just gone out my back door and skied. No, God called me to Geneva. And see, so we need to listen. Who are we listen to? And, and, and both these men are good men that hear God constantly. But are they hearing God for you? And who's hearing God for, for you? Now, God sees not just the start, but the end of every story of your life. See, God knew the story I was with uh, Dave and, and Chrissy and Kathy and I. We were down at the lake, spent all day yesterday down at the lake just talking. Uh, and I said, see that long pier there? Uh, I said, when, when God called me here, I went and I sat out there. I didn't have a name. I didn't have a phone number. Uh, and I said, God, and I'm looking at the city, and I said, God, what, what do I do? And he said, start walking. So I got up and started walking. I said, now stay here. All right, now here, see the long pier? And Dave says, yeah. I said, okay, see between those trees? See the two steeples over there? That gray one? That's ours, right? He said, yeah. So God knew the start from the now. I hope this isn't the end. <laughs> uh, close to it. We were talking yesterday. We keep talking about these old people. And he said, Man, they got to be 70. So, oh, 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 and that, that's us. <clears throat> but anyway, I said, Dave, I was sitting here and God knew I'm going to stand there. God knows your beginning and God knows where He's taking you. He even knows your end. God knows your beginning and where He's taking you. When you want to belong to God and be led by God, He already wants that. He's already setting people up in your life. He's all, that's why I had all of you waiting when I, I came to say, hey, you want to start Start a Bible study, and all of you said, Yeah, let's start a Bible study and started a church, right, Dick? See, and it's like God knows where He's taking you, God knows who He's going to put in your life, and God knows who He's going to take out of your life. God knows who He's going to put you into their life, and God knows when He's going to take you out of their life. And you say, What's happening? Well, sometimes you don't know, sometimes you just have to accept it by faith. And so, what happens then? God is blessing you because He knows the beginning and He knows the end. And He knows when people are right for you, and He knows when people are not right for you. <clears throat> he will allow them to be removed from your life. 
So I want you to stop and think for a minute. How do you feel in church? Like right now, how do, how do you feel? Do you feel good? I mean, do you feel like, you know, you come here to hear the Spirit of God. You come and you sense goodness, right? Now, with that in mind, how do you sense that goodness, let's say, sense God in your life when you leave the church? You're supposed to take the same Spirit here with you to home, you're to take the same spirit with you here out to your job, out to your family, out to your friends. See, there should be no change in your sense, your awareness of God. Now, when <clears throat> I realized what with Dave yesterday and Chrissy and Kathy and I, we just sense God while we're sitting down at the lake because, you see, those people, or are we, like Andrew and, and Peter, like I said earlier, uh, Andrew said to Peter, we have found the Savior. Otherwise, we've all been looking, and now we've found Him. And when Peter went, he said, behold, the Son of God. And so when you find your we, it is, catch this, it is always going and should be centered on God. And so the reason Dave and I are always together, yes, we have the motorcycle ministry together. Yes, we have the uh, Christian family. Yeah, yeah. But the reason the four of us are together, they're part of our we. Because we are seeking God. And then I talked to Jim Carter that night and I told him about an hour and a half on the phone and he just loves it. Why? He used to be here. He, knew, he knows you. He knows this ministry. And, and Jim Carter, we prayed on... We all four prayed before they left. On Jim Carter, we prayed on the phone. They're part of, he's part of our we. Uh, Deb and I, we've agreed every time we're together, we will pray before we leave. We're making a we. See, the ones that are closest to me, I want to... Ha it is centered because of God. That's why the church, that's why we get together and pray. Because we are centered in Christ and grounded <coughs> in the Lord. And so you take that we and compare your church to your family gatherings or your job setting or your close friends and you can ask, where is God in those relationships? Now the fourth area of why God will remove people from your life is, could be, because you've become dependent on someone other than God. God wants you dependent on Him and Him alone. Yes, you can have relationships, you build them, but you are dependent upon God. So remember, He's a jealous God. And anyone you prioritize more than Him is considered an idol in your life. Now we're getting heavy, okay? Now we're getting to where, I don't know about this. You better know about this. God and God alone is the only one who will never leave you. Everybody else can forsake you. We, <laughs> half the church have been through divorces. Half the church have had family. God and God alone will never leave you. So anyone you prioritize more than Him is considered an idol. So do not place someone above Him. He's your Creator. He deserves first in your life. Now, okay, this, we're getting heavy now, okay, so don't jump up and run out. This is getting deep. God wants to be first in your life, before your family, before your job, before your hobbies, before... Let me give you an example. Years ago, there was a man here that came, he visited his family, attended here, and... Ray's staunch Catholic, but is all just religion. He never, you know. And he asked Jesus into his life, and wow, all of a sudden, he understood why he'd been doing all the you know, religious things, the, the, the meaning behind all that. And, and so he wanted to be baptized. And I thought, this is interesting, because the guy was in his 80s, and, and uh, <laughs> you got to know his family. They all, you know, staunch other church. Uh, and, but he, he was excited about being baptized. And so... He came to be baptized, and I said, well, where's your wife? Well, she's home cooking dinner because we're going to have this big celebration at home uh, for the baptism. <laughs> now, people, husbands and wives are supposed to be one. 
in the Spirit too. And you're going to be bad. You are commit. He's let, he's, he brought some friends. And this is staunch. I mean, this guy was staunch. He's given his life to Jesus in his early 80s. And he wants everybody to know. And all the family are going to meet over at house for dinner. The wife's cooking. Eat later, people. You know how many people... <laughs> okay, i going to start stepping on toes now. You know how many people don't come to church because I've got to cook dinner where a family's getting it? Eat later. Rejoice now. If you're putting dinner before Jesus, before being in church, worshiping God, supporting the body of Christ, your priorities are wrong. Priorities mean be in church. You need it. I don't know if you ever want... I need it. You feed me, I feed you. This is the body of Christ. And so priorities, we need to understand. So, <laughs> he got baptized, he was excited, and she didn't get it at all. Exodus 34 says, For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. A jealous God. Men, have you ever looked at a woman with your wife around? <laughs> nah, I won't even go there. Okay. No, I will go there. <clears throat> My wife and I have this saying. She started with her first husband while he was alive. They'd see an attractive woman, and, and, and he would say, oh, she's attractive. And she would say, Kathy would say, yeah, but she's not happy. You, know, you can't be beautiful and be happy, right? Not if you're more beautiful than me, or you look better than me, you know. And so Kathy and I picked that up. <clears throat> and so uh, we were at the uh, resort uh, this last, last week, uh, and there's a woman cleaning, and, and she comes in, and I mean, she's a knockout. Uh, I mean, I see her, and she's foreign. She's from other country, Eastern Bloc, and she has an accent. That's even better, right? And, and I'm looking, and so I go, and I go, and I say, hey, Kathy, <clears throat> woman out here, she's not happy. And... Uh, <laughs> Kathy sticks her head out and says, whoa, she's miserable. I said, yeah, miserable, right? I said, she even has an accent. Really miserable. And so we were laughing about that. Well, the next day I see her, and I said, let me tell you a story. And so I tell her about, you know, we looked at you and said, you're not happy. Well, she started laughing. I said, matter of fact, my wife stuck her head out and said, whoa, she's miserable. And, and so we, each morning I said, hi, misery. How you? And she started laughing, you know. Uh, and, and so... Uh, but see, men and women, you, you know what, what jealousy is, right? I, I mean, if you don't now, you did before. God is jealous of you when you put something before God. God's jealous of you when you put somebody before God. The Scripture says so. We don't see, And God knows all of our thoughts. God knows our priorities. And so God assesses every relationship before He removes someone from your life. So do not get mad when He wants to detach you from other people. Maybe they've distracted you from your devotion to the Lord or your vision from God. We had a leader of the Melchizedek. So he was doing great. Uh, and then he got married. And one time they rode up here and she's on a motorcycle. Well, in the Melchizedek, women don't ride. Hell's angels don't ride their women. We don't ride them. That's the only people we minister to. Other Christian groups, they all ride and they ride their kids, and all, but not the Melchizedek. And so they ride up and I see her riding her own bike. And so as they leave, I ask Pastor Jim, what's with... He says, I don't know. Well... Long story short, give up the bike or give up the ministry. She's not riding with the Melchizedek. Now, i got to explain that to you. You don't want to bring your wife. Well, I mean, I did, but that later with a balloon. But anyway, women cause trouble. I'll just put it that way. They don't cause it. The guys cause it. So to eliminate that problem, just leave them home. Well, it's either Melchizedek or my wife riding. Bye. Because these are the rules. This is the way you see. If you don't see the vision, you have to leave the group. And so he left the group. And so you say, my, now what's going to happen? And God raised David up. So God took Inkmark out and raised David up, and he's better than Inkmark ever could be. God will remove people from your life, from your ministry, from your relationship, to bring somebody else in that either needs it, 
or somebody else that can help even more so. So the majority of men that I have known have lost the ministry due to their wife. Now listen to this. Money, sex, power, and your spouse will cause you to succeed or fail on how you use that. Money, sex, power, and your spouse. And your spouse is to be your helpmate, not your hindrance. And in that case, it was a hindrance. Now the fifth and last step <clears throat> is another reason why God will take somebody out of your life in order to bring somebody else in. Removal of a person from your life can be the sign that God wants to bring someone else in. In other words, this can be His way to make room for an individual that you might need more or vice versa in your life. And I remember back when we had a guitar player, uh, Chris, and he got transferred up to Rochester and we lost him. What are we going to do? And for those of you that were here, uh, God brought Ivan in and Ivan was even better. I thought, oh, praise God. And then Ivan uh, resigns and takes a, a, a ministry up on, on the, uh, in, uh, in Canadian, a, a, uh, what do I want to say, Indian reservation. Uh, and I thought, what are we going to do? I mean, Ivan was good uh, and he brought Kevin in. Oh my goodness, Kevin's even a lot better, you know, uh, 100% better. And, and, and now all of a sudden, uh, uh, Kevin's law, gone and, and uh, what are we going to do for a worship leader? And uh, well, Maybe that person's not going to be as dynamic and, and talented and skilled, but maybe that person just loves God. Last week, somebody played off-key or sang off-key. I never get that. I, I don't hear it. I'm tone deaf. But I heard that. And so I'm looking at Ruth, and Ruth smiles and keeps singing a little louder. And everybody gets back on key. And I thought, now there's the difference. We're just a church worshiping God, and nobody's upset. I thought, that's even better. We're a church worshiping God, and that's good. So, we need to realize that God can make room for another individual who might need you more, or you, him, or her. For instance, God removed Kevin in order to bring Deb into office. See, God is in control of this ministry. Not me, not Kevin, not Deb, not Elder, not... God is in control of this ministry. If we're yielding to God and striving our best, God stays in control. And now, wherever God is going to take Kevin and end up, he will have his ministry and he'll be blessed. And we're blessed with Deb and her ministry here. Ladies, every lady in this church, you need to be at Girls Morning Out. That is the best thing that has happened to women in this church in, what, 43 years we've been here. We need, you need to, it's building the sisters the, in Christ, building them up. And this is heart to heart. This is, God has blessed Deb with a blessing, uh, that, that a heart blessing from God to women. So be here at Girls Morning Out. Now, also understand, now this is really important in closing, also understand that there is an addition in every removal. There is an addition in every removal. It's a biblical truth. But there's a saying, man adds, God multiplies. And in Scripture, that's true. Okay? Man adds and subtract, God multiplies. Paul and Barnabas separated, that's subtracting, and God multiplied, you see, because they multiplied the ministry. So wherever Kevin ends up, God's going to multiply. Wherever we end up, God's already multiplying. And so when we understand that, three people have left, being that family, that we're serving, Seven new people are now serving with their talents, gifts, and abilities in those areas. So God does what? He multiplies. See, it's, benef it's, your benef it's to your benefit when God makes way for you to meet someone else or opens a new door of opportunity. So the transition in your life is because God is working in your life. The transition of this church is because 
Because God is working in this church. And we're all saying, well, what's happening? Well, let me in on a secret from the pastor. I don't know. Yeah. But I know it's good. And I know we're in God. And I know His will will fulfill. You know, I, I skipped the Melchizedek application. I was going, uh, got pictures sent to me yesterday. The Melchizedeks were cooking while we we're uh, uh, Dave and I are together, uh, and they had a, the uh, Leathernecks, a national motorcycle club of all retired uh, 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 Marines. Sorry, Sonny. Sorry about that. Sonny, you're going to throw a book at me. Okay. So he's got all these pictures of all these retired Marines, Leatherneck patches, a whole new avenue for the Melchizedeks. You know what that is? That's men. Melchizedek's ministering to men. There's a whole line of them. Marines. <laughs> God will reach anybody. God will reach everybody if we, the believer, will listen, allow God to move people in, allow God to move people out, move us in and move us out. It's the will of God. And that's how He multiplies. That is how He ministers to His body the body of Jesus Christ. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray a blessing on everyone here. You've brought them here. There's a reason they're here. Show them Your will, step by step. For some, show them a vision that's down the road. that They'll say, yeah, right. But they know it's of You. Father, show them the next step, their faithfulness, reward, and honor because you have a plan for their life. Every person here you know by name. So Lord, let them know how special you are to them, how special, how divine your will is in their life. Fulfill your will in every person's life here. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Though I wake to a world with more questions than answers, where dissonant voices ignite division, my heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in Heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. Though the struggles I face may be painful, though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice, it's not an easy choice, but it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone, I choose thankful.